the line. Hi. Um, as Elon said, my name is Taurus Baylog. Um, when it comes to open source, I'm probably most well known for the OpenNMS project. We have a booth down in the uh, um, show floor. I've been uh, working with open uh, source for a rather long time, um, mainly trying to build a business model around it. And um, so I discovered that if you, if you want to get your talk approved at conferences, it helps to have a very controversial title, like open source is dead. Um, it's not really the, uh, it, as you can tell, there's, there's almost 3,000 people showing up here today uh, to learn more about open source, so open source is definitely not dead. But what I kind of wanted to talk about was a little bit about the history of um, open source software, my involvement with it, and how the original perception of open source has changed, and how that previous perception might be dead, and, um, but uh, while open source is really thriving. Now, I got my first computer in 1978. Uh, this is a picture from my yearbook. So uh, this is, I think, in 82. So I had this, had this system for a while. It was a tier, uh, Tandy Radio Shack TRS-80 Model 1. Uh, came originally with a whopping 4K of RAM. K of RAM. Huh? You only had two? Because I'm... Ah, OK, OK. Um, this is the only, as far as I know, these are, these are the only two surviving pictures of that TRS-80. And uh, all I can remember is that the yearbook found out I had a computer, had no idea what it was. I mean, this is, they didn't know, what, I mean, computers are ubiquitous today. And all I can remember thinking is, there's a girl in my room. <laughs> but, so they, they published these pictures. And uh, so here I had a, had a computer. And, and what they ended up doing was, this was the caption. And I'm not kidding you, this is the actual caption that's under these pictures in the yearbook is a catching the latest computer news Taurus finds nothing phony about his magazine uh, okay first of all they misspelled my name I don't have the first U um, and I'm like really, you know, that's how strange computers were back then they didn't know what they didn't know what to make of it and so they saw the phone in the picture and made a phone joke um, now they did have an interesting thing about magazines because Back then, we didn't have the internet. I mean, the internet was around, but we didn't have bulletin board systems. We didn't have modems. We didn't have internet. We had hobbyist magazines. And so I actually had to find these two. These are two that I used to subscribe to. One was Creative Computing and Kilobod Microcomputing. Now, back then, almost by default, all software was open source because a lot of the computers at the time ran basic. Uh, basic is an interpreted language, and so you'd get program listings. And I would get my program listings via magazines. So every month I would look forward to my magazine, and I would spend hours typing in the program. Um, and then I'd spend hours debugging the syntax errors and other things that I added to the program. Um, but we didn't have this term of free software or open source or anything like that. It was just software. That's what we got. You know. Um, then, fancy, so this is, I'm like 14 at this time. I didn't have much money, but my neighbor got a TR-80 Model 3, the much nicer one, and there was a thing called C-Load Magazine. It came on a cassette. And I apologize for the quality of this picture, but it's about the best one I could find. I mean, this is a picture I had. There's a guy who runs the TR-80 Museum, and I tried to sell these on eBay for like a dollar, and no one was interested, so I just sent them to the TR-80 Museum. I said, here, you know, maybe you could find these for them. So... So it just had so you get this little cover program you'd run and it had like a table of contents and then this is Chompers is a game so there's instructions and then you'd run a game and so my friend would loan me you know we were kind of we'd share TRS-80 stuff I'd loan him some of my I'd compile stuff copy him the cassette and give them to him he would give me C Load magazine so this concept of like buying software was kind of strange to me you know it just it wasn't you know software you bought the hardware software was kind of free until I bought my first piece of uh, computer software. It was the Microsoft Create, it was the Colossal Cave Adventure, which used to live on VAC systems. And Microsoft actually commercialized it, bottled it up, and I couldn't find a picture. This is for the Apple II, but uh, I actually had the one for the TRS-80. Um, and it also, so I didn't, you know, I knew that Microsoft did some basics and some stuff like that, but I had no idea uh, that they would become what they became. Th but they used, they did, you know, computer games. It's like one of the first things they did. Um, of course, they ended up putting a weird little disk format on the floppy disk so you couldn't copy it. And so I can remember the first piece of computer software I ever bought. I think it was $20. And I bought this Microsoft Adventure, and it, um, 
and you couldn't copy it because Microsoft was smart, so they ended up you know, setting it up so you couldn't copy it. Um, so, and so this is again, I got my computer in 1978. Most of this stuff that I'm talking about happened in the early 80s, like 81, 82. Now, when I mentioned that we weren't geeks back then, we weren't we were hobbyists. And in 1976, a gentleman named William Gates wrote a very infamous letter called an open letter to hobbyists. And I want to put this, you know, as a, the majority of hobbyists must be aware, most of you steal your software. You know, this is kind of the apple in the Garden of Eden kind of thing where you suddenly become aware of your nakedness. It's like, what do you, what do you mean we steal our software? You know, I get a magazine and I type it in and I make changes and I give it to my neighbor and, you know, he does stuff and he gives me stuff we just share. It's not stealing. But Bill was in, in, you know, introducing this concept that, you know, hey, the software itself is a commodity. It's a, it's a product. And, you know, we don't share it. You can buy it. Otherwise, you steal your software. You know, who, who cares on it if you, if you worked on it to get paid? Um, so if we flash forward 10 years later, Microsoft had their IPO. This is 1986. Microsoft came out and had their IPO. Um, I do want to point out, it's kind of funny, is when they, when they IPO'd, Lotus was still bigger than them. So Lotus, who came out with one, two, three. My dad, so I, I was the hobbyist. I got the TRS-80. My dad, the businessman, got the IBM. He got an IBM 5150 with 256K soldered to the motherboard in discrete chips. Um, and one of the things he, he pretty much used it for was Lotus 1, 2, 3, that spreadsheet. And it was, it was like a godsend to, to spreadsheet people and made Lotus lots and lots of money. So here Microsoft did. And I kind of want to point out that so Bill Gates owned 45% of Microsoft at the IPO, and it was worth $350 million. So the market cap of Microsoft at their IPO was around $800 million. That's a considerable amount of money, especially in 1986. But hold that number in mind, because we're going to revisit this. So here it is. You know, Microsoft has this big IPO. They're making lots and lots of money. Where, what happened to the hobbyists? You know, what happened to this kind of community we used to have and things like that? Well, there was a gentleman up in, uh, in Massachusetts, who we might all recognize, uh, named Richard Stallman. And... Uh, uh, Richard M. Stallman, and he had this thing that, hey, this is wrong. You know, software should be free. You know, this idea of compartmentalizing and commercializing and walling off access to software. And so also in 1986, in February of 1986, a month before the Microsoft IPO, he published his list of four freedoms. I assume most of you have seen this before, right? This is kind of the definition of free software. So freedom number zero, of course he has to use ordinal numbering. So freedom number zero, a freedom to run a program. You can use, you got a piece of software, you can run it any way you want to. You, I can't restrict how you use the software. Um, the freedom to study how the program works. You gotta have the access to the source code in order to see how the program works. Then we get to the third one, which adds this kind of weird twist on it. Uh, freedom to redistribute copies of the program so you can help your neighbor. When have you ever seen any kind of business or any kind of manifesto coming out like this, which has this term, you can help your neighbor? Interesting. You know, it's an interesting take for free software, so you can help your neighbor. And then the freedom to distribute copies of your modified version, so the right to make derivative works. So here is like, you can run the program any way you want, you can see how the program works, you can copy the program as much as you want, and then you can change it and distribute your copies. And it says, by doing this, you can give the whole community a chance. Again, interesting wording. So we're helping our neighbor, and we have this term community. And it's like, well, what, what, is, what does community remind me of? Community, community. Well, it's quite obvious that he's a communist. So open source and free software is always, or free software is always about communism. You know, viva la revolution. You know, we're going to go out there and we're going to, you know, no business. We're not going to do any, you know, help your neighbor. We're communists. Everyone the same. Openista. I love this picture. And so I have a t-shirt with it. On it so, um, you know, it's not, you know, we know that this isn't the case. And uh, one of the people who proved this wrong, and I dug this up of archive.org. This is the first web page of Red Hat I could find. You know, there's, there's uh, Jason's looking at me in horror because he actually works for Red Hat. So, you know, so Red Hat's in North Carolina, where I'm from, and they're just quietly going on, and they're, they're promoting um, Linux. 
you know, as an operating system and then as an ecosystem and stuff like that. Um, you know, and you know, you'd think of this kind of communist idea of free software. You know, how would you know a company want to make money? How how do you make money on free software? So they're kind of trying to figure out a business plan. Now this is kind of you got to remember. You know, I came from the you got your your source code magazines and you shared your cassette tapes, and you know it's kind of this free software thing. And it, here this guy's like, I'm going to embrace that idea, but I'm going to try to make a business. And um, it's impossible, right? You can't make a business out of it. Yes, sir. This was uh, uh, 96. I think this was like April of 96 was the earliest version of that. I meant to actually put that on there, but yeah, I love archive.org. Archive.org is awesome. Now, I'm sure it didn't look like this. I'm sure there was some other kind of formatting that got lost when they uh, they did it. But um, So, okay, so it's crazy to try and make money off of free software. I pulled this up from yesterday. <laughs> you know, so Red Hat's market cap right now is just shy of thirteen billion dollars. Okay, that's not chump change. I mean, you got to think that you know when um, Red Hat, when Microsoft had their IPO, they had a market cap of around eight hundred million. Now, granted, that was nineteen eighty-six dollars versus twenty fifteen dollars, but still thirteen billion dollars. And part of this this business, uh, th this kind of commercialization of open source software or free software, excuse me, free software, um, we needed a new name for it. Because, you know, you, you got this, this free software is this idea of, you know, help your neighbor and give to the community. This isn't about that. It's like definitely, you, you know, every good business wants to give something to their, give some value to their customers for a reasonable price. I mean, you're not trying to screw your customers. You want more customers. You want your customers to be happy, and you want your customers to feel good about giving you money. So it's not a it's not kind of a bad thing, but we needed a new term. Yeah, except for Verizon. It's funny. Um, so there were a few guys involved in this. I've happened to, to just put the pictures of the guys I have, have I've met. But there's John Mad Dog Hall, um, uh, Eric uh, Raymond, ESR, and Michael Tiemann, um, among others. There was Sam Ackman. There were a number of other people got together and wanted to coin this term called open source software. And kind of a, uh, it was originally embraced by uh, Richard Stallman, and he changed his mind, um, which he's, he's free to do. But um, it is this idea of, okay, can we come up with a definition of, of free software that isn't necessarily about helping your neighbor and giving to the community, something that's a little more business friendly? And so they came up with the open source definition. And I get in huge arguments that, you know, free software isn't open source, and open source isn't free software. Well, if you look at the open source definition, you can map the ten requirements of the open source definition to the four freedoms. I mean, they are the same thing. But it was definitely a mental change. And part of it that, that says business friendly, it's like, no discrimination against fields of endeavor. I'd seen some people in the free software world put a restriction. So they offered under the GPL with the addition, which they're not really allowed to do, but they'll say, no military use. You can't use my software in a military use. Or you can't use it for government features or something like that. So a very small minority of people do this, but it does happen. And they specifically say, no, you can't do that. If it's open source software, you can't, you know, you've got to have the freedom to redistribute it. You get to see the co source code. You get to make derived works. You have to honor the integrity of the original author. You've got to give them credit, which I think is a great idea. You can't discriminate. You can't say you can't use it. I mean, I would love to say, hey, if you're a neo-Nazi fascist, you can't use OpenNMS. But you can't do that. It's, it's part of the open source definition. So in my mind, I almost think open source definition is a little freer, in a sense, than the free software definition. Because it expressly states things that the free software um, definition implies. Um, and so this is kind of, a, kind of a, 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 a watershed event, because now we have this thing called open source software, and people just grabbed onto this. Um, I would say, you know, in part, the first internet bubble was uh, driven by open source software. In 1995, Netscape had their IPO, which kind of started the, the internet bubble, if you will. And then it kind of kind of went on, um, I put this slide up because it's kind of funny. Um, VA Linux registered, they had their IPO, and this was in December of 99. So Red Hat had its IPO in, I think, September of 99? It was in the same year. It was like a few months before VA Linux. Uh, and so VA Linux, their price went up almost 700%. Uh, 
on the first day of trading. People were open source crazy, and it, which is funny because this gave them a market cap of $9.5 billion with a B. And so we started off Microsoft's IPO. They had a market cap of $800 million. You know, right now, Red Hat has a market cap of $13 billion. And now we're looking at, you know, VA Linux came out, and they were worth $9.5 billion. And my favorite part of this is this sign here, or more than half that of Apple Computer. <laughs> For those of you who don't follow such, such things, Apple Computer is worth $700 billion right now. So uh, the fact that VA Linux in 1999 was worth more than half of Apple Computer, it's just funny to me. I'm sorry. So... Um, at this point in time, I, 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 my, my life was not, um, I didn't do, uh, I was doing commercial software. I was doing um, a lot of stuff with uh, tools from HP, IBM, network management, because that's kind of what I do. Um, still liked this idea of open source, but I really wasn't involved in it. Um, so some people I knew started a company called Oculan, and they were the ones who founded OpenNMS. So they started the OpenNMS project, of which I'm one of the maintainers. Um, I started working for them because they kind of, I'd, I'd always been interested in this open source. The, the hobbyist in me was like, you know, that was a really fun time to be involved in software. Um, so I got involved and I started working for Oculan on September 10th, 2001. And so on September 11th, 2001, we sat and watched TV like everybody else. <laughs> and uh, now the internet bubble was already dying in 2001, late 2000, 2001. I mean, it, it was it was not, um, you know, we didn't have people with huge billion dollar uh, valuations that were doing free software. Um, but uh, the nail in the coffin to me was 9-11. Like, if, if I had to, 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 to put, like the error of what we've known as the 60s, some people will claim that that's not from 1960 to 1970. Instead, it's from the assassination of Kennedy in 63 to the resignation of Nixon in 72. You can kind of, there was a cultural thing. For me, the Netscape IPO was the, the start of the internet bubble. And 9-11 uh, just put the, put the nail in the coffin. So I started work, free software. I'm trying to, trying to build a business around selling OpenNMS as free software in, uh, in 2001. Um, but we had, a, we, had some, we had some guideposts. We, 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 we didn't give up hope yet. Um, ESR, Eric Raymond, uh, wrote this interesting book called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. It's a little dated now. Um, he talked a, uh, quite a bit about Netscape, and Netscape uh, didn't end well, I would say. Um, but it was this interesting idea. There's a lot of goodness. Everyone's familiar with this book, I think. I'm not introducing anything new, I hope. Uh, if I am, please run out. It's online. Just get it and read it. Um, but it's this idea that there is a, a, a business value to sharing when it comes to technology. This stuff that we did as hobbyists actually can benefit businesses. And, uh, you know, so I was out there saying, I don't want you to use OpenNMS because it's open source. I want you to use it because it's open source gives you a better solution. You don't have vendor lock-in. You can, you know, I would talk to some of our customers and I'll say, well, you know, what they were doing is they'd, they'd get a particular proprietary piece of software and they'd have to fit their business processes to match the, uh, the, propri the, the, the software because it, it only worked one way. And I'm like, well, no, your business processes are what differentiate you from the other guys. <laughs> So what you should really do is fit your tool to the business process. And so we started a business basically doing consulting and support because we're still kind of searching for a business model and we're trying to generate revenue. Um, Red Hat, I love this company. Uh, it's a great company, um, but there's not another one. You can't really point. No one's ever really been able to duplicate. I thought MySQL had a shot, you know, but then MySQL got bought by Oracle through Sun, so, um, so that's kind of wasn't happy ending. Um, so we're out there, we're, we're fighting the good fight, and we go to these trade shows, and people started coming up to us in these conferences, and they go, yeah, but how much is your enterprise version? Hmm? Like, we only have one version, and it's our enterprise version, and it's free. <laughs> and then it's trash. I'm like, it's free software. It's not a free solution. You know, don't, you know, download it and then expect me to spend a month fixing it for you. You know, you, you download it, you can either pay me to fix it for you, or you can learn how to use it yourself. But... You know, and I can help you with that if you pay me. So it's not a free solution, but it's free software. But it turned out there were a number of companies that were going out, and they were basically having a little, like a lost leader. They were trying to leverage this open source term as a proprietary software company. So they would give a version that was their, 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 their they called it open core. 
So it's like, here's our core version, and it, it does some things, but if you want all these cool features, well, then you've got to pay us, and we're going to license it under a very restrictive license that doesn't match any one of the ten freedoms in the, in the ten points of the open source definition or any of the four freedoms. And I was trying to explain this to a friend of mine who's a marketing guy. He has no, he's not in the business. He's not a technologist. I said, yeah, there's these companies out there. They're saying they're open source, but they're not, and it's really confusing the market because everyone thinks that they have to pay extra for open source. And he goes, oh, so it's kind of like open source. <laughs> and so he came up with, we actually own fopensource.org, so we this is the open source definition. But, um, you know, it's a software that claims to be open source but lacks the full freedom. You know, it, to me, if you, if, you, if you get a piece, I can charge you for software. I don't have a problem with that. But once I get it, I should be able to use it under a free license. Red Hat, I came up with this thing called the CentOS test. So Community Enterprise Operating System is basically a group of guys. They get Red Hat. They, they buy Red Hat Enterprise Linux subscription. They strip out all of the trademark Red Hat stuff. They recompile the binaries from, from source, and they distribute it. And how did Red Hat react to this? They actually, I think you provide support for CentOS now, I think, is one of the options. Yeah. So it's like they said, okay, fine. You know, because their core business isn't affected. The people who want to use CentOS aren't necessary. They're not good fit. They're not a good fit for Red Hat's customer base. And so Red Hat's able to go and do their thing, CentOS. And to me, if it passes a CentOS test, if I can take your binaries, remove all your trademark stuff, recompile it, rename it. Um, the first time I had to use a, to hire a lawyer in my entire business, the first time I hired a lawyer was this company in um, Orange County called Tyrell. They came out OpenMS for Mac. And I'm like, what? Because <laughs> at the time, we required Java 1.2, which wasn't available, and you had to have like the developer's kit. So we had a version through this project called Sync, but you had to have this special license that got you Java 1.2. And so I'm like, what is it? We, you know, we don't run on Jaguar because it only uses Java 1.0. Well, what they'd done is they had stripped out all of the stuff that required Java 1.2, Recompiled it and labeled it OpenNMS 1.0 Alpha, and they were selling, you know, giving it, distributing it as OpenNMS. And I had to, to tell them, you can't do that. <laughs> That's my name. You know, you can call it Tyrell NMS, Bubba NMS, you can call it whatever you want to, but go build your own brand. <laughs> you know, this is my brand. And so I had to have a lawyer file, sign a cease and desist letter, and they, they, they ceased and desist. But, um, you know, it's one of those things where that, that was kind of the, so if you can take it, strip out all of the stuff that, that, that Mozilla is the same way. That's why you have Ice Weasel on Debian instead of Firefox, because Firefox is a protected brand, and, you know, even though it's I pretty much identically the same code, it, you know, that's, that's Mozilla's brand, and so Debian can build their own brand. Um, and this, luckily, this has gone away. You don't see this much anymore. Um, there was an article, there's, Gartner is a big analyst group, and, uh, and Gartner has this guy named Brian Prentice, who I really like, he's down in Australia, I've talked to him a couple of times. Um, and he published this thing in, in, in March of 2010 called The Open Core, The Emperor's New Clothes. And he basically said, look, if you're considered, you know, probably uh, an open source, open core software vendor is going to knock at your door, talk about all the great things op about open source, but their product is a proprietary software product. And so when you're approaching the buying decision, he said, don't buy, he said, I'm not telling you not to buy open core, but you have to treat it like any other proprietary software purchase because you don't get the full value. And this didn't end it overnight, but when someone like Gartner comes out and says, hey, look, your business model sucks. <laughs> you know, so most of the open core vendors that are still around, you don't see open source. You go to their website, they, they don't mention open source, which is okay with me. I love the fact HP, Red Hat, Rackspace, we're actually building some cloud stuff right now, working with Rackspace because we've, we've dealt with them for, uh, since we started. Um, but if we don't like it, we have options because it's open source. I can go, I can build to OpenStack, and if I want to, I can choose my vendor. And there's a huge power in that. So this idea of you know, being proprietary and building these proprietary things failed in the case of Eucalyptus. Now, Mikos isn't there, and Eucalyptus is, is probably pivoting and, and kind of loosening up on some of their things, but they missed an opportunity. You know, to me, OpenStack is it. I mean, that's kind of the cloud environment that people were embracing, and, uh, and they missed it. It's kind of Betamax to, to VHS. Um, the, the genesis of this talk came I love these conferences. I love things like scale because um, uh, it's grassroots. I mean, this is all volunteer organization, and it's huge. I went to the last uh, Linux World Expo. It was called Open Source World, and there were they literally, after the keynote, they had to get rid of like half the chairs because the few people who were there, we, we were spread out, and it looked like no one was there. And here, it's like this place is packed, and there's like 
as I said, I'm glad you came to my talk, but there's a whole bunch of other talks going on right now that are awesome. And, uh, you know, so grassroots effort. I really, really like that. Um, so I went to OzCon, and um, so I, I was wandering around, and the genesis for this, so OzCon is one of the few open source, like commercial open source conferences out there. And so I'm wandering around the show floor. Again, we got the lady with the blue hair, so I know it was an open source conference. Um, and I walked around, and the first thing you see is this big HP booth. You know, so there's, and they'd have a big booth here. They're right across from us. And then you've got Microsoft in the corner. HP and Microsoft. These aren't companies you associate with open source software. And then I went, and there was PayPal. I have a friend who works at PayPal up in Portland, and, you know, PayPal, huge booth. Again, PayPal, open source, real cognitive dissonance for me because I'm like, PayPal's not an open source company. But it turns out almost every company now is an open source company. Um, Rackspace, good old Rackspace was there. Um, I actually added a slide yesterday. I was wandering around the uh, exhibit hall, and I found this nice lady. She's at Disney. <laughs> You know, and she's there, DisneyCareers.com. That's what she's there for. They're hiring geeks. You know, it's never been a better time to be a geek, especially an open source geek, because you can get nice jobs. All of our media is being made into blockbuster movies. I mean, it's just a great time to be a geek. And, um, and you know, here's the thing. You want a job? There's, a, there's tons of I'm hiring. And that was the thing at, at OzCon. There would be, like, based on open source tools. So we've kind of found this business model. You know, we found this business model where commercial companies have found its own, in their own advantage to hire and use open source tools and developers. But where's the open ESTIS part? Where do I get my free software? You know, because I'm getting tools, but where do I get my free software? Well, it turns out that all these developers who are working in these free software communities dig it. They like it. And it's like, wow. You know, when I get stuck on a problem, I can just, p you know, paste it in paste bin, and some guy on the IRC channel will say, oh, you need to do this. I mean, I'm not saying it happens every time, but it's this, this community and building. So what do they do? They go off and build really cool stuff. So I have a totally different talk about why I gave up Apple and switched to Linux. And I was using a lot of expletives from about 11 to 11.20 as I was trying to translate my... Um, uh, my presentation from my Linux Mint Debian Edition laptop to this Apple. One of the things happened is I downloaded, uh, so I got installed, so I downloaded LibreOffice. I'm like, great. So I tried to launch it, and it would sit there and spin, and it would sit there and spin. And it goes, oh, this isn't verified, so I'm not going to run it. So I'm like digging around in the security things, and I had to turn off. If it didn't come from the App Store, and if it wasn't signed by Apple, I couldn't run it. You know, I had to, uh, but I, luckily there's an option. With the iPhone, you haven't got that option. You know, you got this option. So I was able to click an option and get it installed. And just tons of stuff. I've gotten so used to using that. And again, I use Linux Mint. This doesn't mean it's better than Fedora. It doesn't mean it's better than Ubuntu. It just works for me. And I honestly wish I could actually work on like five identical computers, one with each different distribution on it, to see which one I liked more. Because you get kind of caught into it. And in this meta, so I have a picture of the LibreOffice of the presentation in the presentation. Um, but, uh, and then I also have Galaxy Quest, so that's kind of cool. But, I mean, I love, so I run, I have uh, two desktops, I have a laptop, and they're all running Linux Mint, and I, lo I, I, I had to get a, I, I meant to put a slide up here, I had to get a CT scan a while back, and I had the, the doctor give me a CD with the images on it, and I stuck it in my, my machine, and it, of course, it had a little built-in Windows app that you could run to see the images, and I just went and found an image file and double-clicked on it, and a little pop-up said, Oh, you don't have a program that it recognizes that images. But here's three choices. There's one called Ginkgo something. So I app get installed Ginkgo. Boom, I'm looking at pictures of my skull. It was awesome. Um, for my phone, I'm actually having some issues this week, and I don't know if it's being in LA or whatnot, but I use the OnePlus One, which uses, it's based on CyanogenMod, which is a fork of the Android open source project. My favorite ROM is OmniROM, but they don't support a version of the OnePlus One yet. And I've even promised the developer, he says, if the developer steps up, I'll buy you <laughs> a OnePlus One so you can use it. Because I love the phone. It's amazing. It is the best phone I've ever used. And I've had iPhones. I've had Samsung phones. I've had HTC phones. It is awesome. Um, but CyanogenMod. Now, CyanogenMod is a company. I think they're evil. But the f when I got this phone, I had root in like two seconds. You know, it wasn't like you had to do tons of weird stuff. I had root. So I run, run on my phone. Again, because it's open source. At my house, 
I got rid of my Airport Express that was all closed in, and I'm running a uh, thing called Tomato USB by Shibby. He's this guy out in Poland, and he basically puts Linux, an incredibly full-featured Linux, that you access through a web browser. So, like, if you come to my house, I live on a 21-acre horse farm out in the middle of nowhere, and I have an open Wi-Fi because you're in my yard if you're using it. And But I was able to, with a, about four or five clicks, to set up a VLAN that only accesses the, the Internet so you can't get access to any of my servers at the house or any of my stuff at the house. But when people come over, they don't have to ask me for my very complex Wi-Fi password. They can just, you know, type it in. Again, free. I sent the guy 50 bucks through the PayPal because um, I really appreciated the stuff he did. Um, if you haven't done so, in, in my divorce from Apple, and I did do the whole, is anyone here old enough to remember the, the I divorced thee, I divorced thee, and he threw the dog poop on the shoes? Um, I don't know, was that enough? Was that enough? It's, it's a Steve Martin bit from Saturday Night Live, and I don't know if it was on the 40-year the, the thing, but I honestly did, because that was with the Apple. It was painful, because I was in the Apple ecosystem. All my photos were in iPhoto, and all my music was in iTunes, and all my things were in Pages, and I was like, ah. Um, so the last piece of OS X that I had in my house was I had a little Mac Mini that was running OS X, and I had this thing called iTV, E-Y-E TV. It's a little USB stick you plug in, and you put your antenna on it, and you get, uh, it's a PVR, a DVR. I think they call them PVRs now, personal video recorders versus digital video recorders. And I replaced it with Kodi. But better yet, I went and got to OpenELEC. OpenELEC are guys who package Kodi on a stick. So you can just plug it in. You got a Raspberry Pi, you go to OpenELEC, you download the thing, you plug it in the thing, you press the thing, and boom, you got, you're, you're running it. And it is slick, because I'm anal retentive, because I'm a geek, and a lot of us are, have issues. And so my TV shows, I have them, you know, the name of the show each season, and then I have each episode in a different folder. Well, Cody actually went, this is my Constantine collection, which should get renewed, damn it, because it's an excellent show. Uh, not the movie with Keanu Reeves. Let's not talk about that. But uh, anyway, so we got Constantine, and it went through, and not only it found art from each of the things, it went up and it put up a little uh, synopsis, and it was all automatic. And it's free software. It didn't cost me a cent. It cost me about a week of my life, because getting the electronic program guide to work is a pain in the butt. But what did I do? I blogged about it and put detailed instructions on how you do it. So I'm, I'm helping the community. Again, you know, it comes from this environment that's being driven by these commercial companies, which I think is really ironic and fun. Um, the other thing I had to replace is my weather station. So I have a weather station on my roof, and I don't use the package software because it sucks. I use something called w WeatherView. Um, I should point out that I live in North Carolina, and the low temperature of 3.6 yesterday morning made me very, very glad I was in L.A. Um, and it made me very upset because the lowest temperature I've measured is 3.3. So we didn't even break a record. So, um, but excellent stuff. And you can customize it. You can change it. It is incredibly powerful. How did I install WView? App get install WView. You know, no license keys, no nothing like that. It just installs. It's awesome. Um, I'm almost done. Um, hey, I'm going to actually finish and I'll, I'll take some questions. Um, uh, one other thing I want to bring about is this guy. And you might have noticed my shirt. Um, uh, I have this I Heart Snowden shirt. Um, I actually wear my I Heart Snowden shirt when I, I actually wear my I Heart Snowden shirt through the airport. <laughs> uh, I think it's above the heads of most of the people who work there, except I did get the stink eye from one guy. Kind of glared at me. Um, a lot of our lives, a lot of our personal uh, uh, information and all is being put into these technology devices that we don't understand. It took me a week to get everything right with Cody, but I learned so much about where the information comes from, how it's distributed, how to go get it, how to modify it, how to deal with it, that I actually feel a lot more comfortable with the system than I would if it was a black box and worked out of the box. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm back on the Twitters. I, I was off the Twitters for a really long time, and I'm not on the Facebooks, and I'm not on the LinkedIn because of privacy issues. But we really need to take into account this idea of privacy. As I said, I've got an hour-long presentation on why this is important, and open source and free software allows us to do that. Again, I feel very, very comfortable. I don't have to worry about Lenovo putting in a rootkit on my Windows install and not telling anybody, or doing it so poorly that it's easy to guess the, the passphrase so that anyone can use it for malicious purposes. Uh, I don't 
honestly don't believe that people intentionally go out to screw you. But um, for me, yes, it requires a little extra work. But uh, in my mind, open source is very, very much alive. And it's, it's issues like the NSA and so We do a lot of business in Europe. And it upticked right after all the Snowden documents leaked because people aren't going to buy something from Oracle and HP or any other proprietary solution. Just having access to source doesn't necessarily mean you know, there aren't any loopholes or, exp um, or exploits, but they're a lot easier to find, at least the potentials there, compared to, say, an Oracle or stuff like that. And so I think it's kind of funny that open source is very much alive in the sense that the corporations and businesses now know it, and it's a really, really great time to be involved in open source. Um, anyway, thank you so much for letting me talk. This is my head. Um, I do have a couple of blogs. So anything dealing with open source is adventuresinoss.com. It's kind of my business blog. I did a blog post this morning about uh, this conference. I love this conference. I have a geek blog, taurus.io, because all the cool kids have .io address. Does anyone else here have a .io address? There's a lot of the cool kids being here. Or maybe I'm not cool anymore. Uh, and then my hobby is I make vintage cocktails. So I have a cocktail blog as well. But any comments, questions? Was this useful? Is this did I entertain you? Did I? Okay. Yeah, well, that's how it all started. I mean, it kind of started there. Thank you, folks. Have a great conference, and I'll be around in the booth uh, today and tomorrow. Oh, tonight at 9 o'clock, uh, a friend of mine, Damien Hess, uh, performs as MC Front a lot. He uh, does nerdcore rap, and he's excellent. If you Just Google him on the, on the YouTubes, and uh, if you don't believe me, um, we're giving away complete uh, collections of his CDs. So if you want to stop by the booth uh, a, a, an hour before it closes, we're giving away uh, one today and one tomorrow, one set today and one set tomorrow. So check it out. Thanks again. Take care.